this is Matt Kazam, and welcome to The Humor Scientist. In this episode, it's all about the words. and choose are making the world more toxic and they're as harmful to our human environment and overall health as anything else because my friends we're going to have to find a way to coexist our village now includes everyone our awareness of each other has grown exponentially and yet our compassion and empathy have only seemed to regress the ecosystem of humanity and the landscape where everyone has a legitimate shot at happiness is broken and a big way we can fix it is by restarting our empathetic engines and considering how we communicate and interact with each other our words and their messaging are making people feel less safe less included and the truth of the matter is if one of us is marginalized then we all are and the words we see and hear every day are having a negative effect that ripples through society Men working signs are a problem. Lots of construction people have been using men working signs, and I think it's not right because girls can do anything. Men working signs are a problem because when little girls see them, they might think, oh, I can't be a construction worker, but I want to. And seeing a little girl feel like that makes me sad. You may be thinking, well, I don't really care, but a little girl might want to do construction, but she will see the sign and think, I can't do construction because the sign says men. A solution would be to have a sign that includes all people. So please change. Now, all of this is the bad news. The good news is with a little intention, a small shift in mindset, we can make some big changes and instantly lower the volume of pain on the planet. This is where the science of joke writing and how stand-up comedians vet and choose every word can be extremely helpful and what we're going to cover in today's episode. Stand-up comedians are on stage night after night, year after year, trying to make that powerful human connection. We are seeing the impact of how the words are being received in real time. And we've all experienced that situation where we said the wrong word or the audience took it the wrong way and we had to climb out of that hole. But for the number of jokes we tell and the thousands of hours we've been on stage, comedians have to learn to be in full command of the words that come out of their mouths and not to break the connection, lose the audience's trust or make them feel unsafe. The science can help all of us out there with your scripted material, just as well as how we communicate with each other on a day to day, giving us the framework to create thoughtful content that taps the science and forges a powerful human connection, creates a sense of belonging and emotionally safe space to share our truths, stories and messages through empathy and trust. Hey, Matt, you're calling me again. What's going on? Hey, listen, we need more background. You know, I think uh, uh, no one really understands humor and public health more than you. So I love having you as my sidekick on these episodes <laughs> because a lot of people don't know you've done stand-up comedy. And as someone who's performed stand-up comedy live on stage in front of folks and also as, you know, the, behind public health campaigns, you must really have an appreciation and attachment to the words you use. I'd like to think so. Um, yeah, that's very kind. That's uh, I think I think saying I did stand up comedy is a little generous, but um, I do really try to be careful with words because um, 
you know, communication, uh, words are like the building block of it and communication, you know, is a matter of life and death. As I started that said the last episode and, um, words really do shape, you know, the messages it's about language and it impacts folks, you know, um, the societal structures to the individuals that live with them, you know, so really words are just everything. And, um, this is really, you know, truly in theory, when we talk about language, um, and its impact on the individual, I'm really literally talking about our societal structures at the policy level. So you think about the language that is used, you know, by politicians and the like, and the impact it can have on healthcare. So even just think about the Affordable Care Act. What did um, the other side that didn't want to have it go through call it? They called it Obamacare, right? And what did President Obama do? He took the word and he used it as his own. Yes, it's Obamacare, let's move it through. Yeah. And that policy didn't just go through and stop there, right? It had an impact on our communities. It had an impact on the organizations that helped deliver care. And then it had an impact on communities as well. Suddenly folks that didn't have access to health insurance and the like, they did. So it really had an impact on that interpersonal level. And then finally on you and me at the individual level. So here's another thing I just put up here, transgender rights. What does that mean? It really depends on your viewpoint, right? And you can see here, these words, these are quite politicized, you know, just two words, George Floyd, two more words, transgender rights. It can have quite a heated response. So on one side, if I say transgender rights, folks are talking about an LGBTQ plus agenda that's limiting religious rights. They're talking about protecting those they see as unprotected women and children from men in dresses. They're talking about permissiveness and ridiculousness and really something like logical fallacies. You know, when you've heard, hear someone say, well, if someone can become a woman, then why can't I be identify as a cat? You know, something silly like that. And then they also talk about panic and distress when being confronted with LGBTQ plus persons and responding in kind with violence. They also talk about sort of subterfuge issues like trans women in sports, even though that's a pretty limited issue in and of itself. Those who are transgender and those who are allies of trans people, they talk about LGBTQ rights, they talk about trans rights as human rights. They want folks to honor their pronouns and talking about words and how they matter, Matt. You know, if you are someone who um, maybe was born or told that you were a boy as a child and you realize that you're actually a girl and you want to mature into a woman, and how would that make you feel if suddenly you were being called him and sir and, and done so in a purposeful way to undermine who you are in the world? What if you've changed your name? and someone uses your old name, which is rightfully called a dead name. It can really unsettle you. It can unpack your mental health. It might make you act out. It might make you feel suicidal even, which is an issue. So in this side, you, talk, talk, you hear people talking about trans lives matter. So truly clear communication really shows where you are on an issue, but it can also improve health literacy around um, really important matters in the world and also around public health. We're concerned about helping people understand their choices, make good decisions around their well-being and that of others, and to help them live as long as possible um, with great quality of life. 
So this is about positively changing social norms around challenging matters. And we also want to create trust when we're doing it because no one likes to be made to feel stupid, right? I mean, would you, how do you, how, what do you think of that, Matt? Absolutely. And, and then nobody likes to be a punchline either, you know? No. I mean, uh, and uh, the trust here, I, I think, is, uh, is so important because the words create the landscape for every important conversation that we're going to have to have. It always reminds me of what you teach when it comes to humor. Um, you never really accomplish your goal. You're never funny when you punch down. Yeah. And truly that's a, a credo in public health as well. Yeah, and even with the choice of words, punch down I think is lazy. Let's talk about a little bit about COVID-19. This is the perfect storm of where inappropriate or inaccurate word uses really created a lot of confusion and ultimately distrust of um, the powers that be and helped um, prolong the pandemic in ways that probably could have been avoided. So first you have really inaccurate descriptions of the virus. It's just like the flu. Um, it's not only impacting you know, older folks, there was a misunderstanding of disease surveillance. So folks thought if someone went five days in a row and got a positive test, that created five new cases. So um, epidemiology is a challenging thing, but it probably would have helped if there were clear directions or um, indications of how diseases, how disease cases were being counted and reported. Um, there was also a ramping up of the politicization around COVID-19, particularly when it came to shutdowns and use and access to things like masks and um, gloves. And there was also a great disparity around who could quarantine and who could not, or should I say who had to quarantine and who did not. So you had leaders who were telling all of their constituents to stay home while they were seen out maybe getting their hair done or going to an event. This all created a great deal of mistrust around politicians and medical professionals. Some of it could have been avoided if they just were a bit clearer about what happens in public health. You know, we get data and, you know, what we think is true can change over time because, you know, we're learning more. It's a novel virus. We didn't know everything right at the start and ideas have changed. However, when it changes herky-jerky and you don't give people any warning, that's where people are going to be very, very distrustful. And it did carry through. You see the same threads of mistrust around the vaccine. I mean, luckily, we have folks going out and getting vaccinated more and more all the time. But we need everyone to go, right? But you can't um, force people to do what they don't want to do. And you see places in the country where there were greater degrees of COVID um, distrust, where they maybe called it the pandemic in the right. Those are the same places where we see less folks getting vaccinated. Um, and those folks are at greater risk for some of the new mutations that are coming out. So hopefully, we can get back on track and create some new messaging that um, connects with those folks um, at the human level. And I wanted to share with you, Matt, just a really great example of the use of humor in this um, pandemic to really communicate some of the challenges that COVID-19 really brings up. So I thought I'd just share them with you. Sure. So this was this great campaign from Canada, and um, it personified uh, COVID as uh, Mr. COVID, and uh, he's a guest in your life, an unwanted one. So the one on the left was during the holiday season where, you know, the messaging was what? Don't get together during the holidays. How popular was that message? Yeah, yeah. You know. So no one wants to hear that. However, they might hear or um, listen to a commercial where Mr. COVID comes over, um, hogs all the food, and then <laughs> makes everybody sick. You yeah. know, so really good um, use of storytelling. 
and the words here, um, nobody loves holiday gathering more than COVID, pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. yeah. And on the right, uh, Mr. COVID is about to go on a date. <laughs> and, and this is um, some of the things that's not been talked about as much um, in the public media, but about um, unprotected sex and the like around COVID-19. And uh, no one wants to go on a date with COVID. He's a, he also doesn't pick up the check. Okay. Yeah, right. And it's so <laughs> thoughtful and a way to say the same thing. I mean, what basically you could say, hey, don't go on a date and have unprotected sex during COVID. Or you can actually think it through and realize what am I really trying to say? And then the humor part of this, once you outline what the character is, what is COVID? It's an unwanted, as you said, an unwanted visitor that uh, you wouldn't want to have hanging around threatening your family around the holidays. But using humor, it softens it. You know, this this campaign in particular, it's not punching down, right? It's no. just, um, it's appealing to the humanity. Uh, people want to get together. They want to have that human connection. It's incredibly unpopular to say um, what needs to be done. No one wants, you know, sure. the medicine's quite bitter. You have to like stay separated. But, um, you know, yeah. Mr. COVID kind of... Uh, uh, is is a is a sweeter way of delivering a very important <laughs> very yeah. important information. Um, having a good laugh about uh, Mr. COVID is something that can really you know bond the community. Sure, and it's not good to punch down unless you're punching down on COVID. He unless doesn't you're get punching a down because this guy's he's rough looking. Right? He doesn't get a pass. <laughs> terrifying. Yeah, wear him out if you have to. And I, I just absolutely love this campaign. Thanks for sharing it for sure. Yeah, thank you. And it's so good to see you. And I'm really excited um, about your conversations with with, um, your guests, you know, huge fans of them both. I can't believe they're going to be on a panel together. There is no um, one who understands words and live, live. They make their living through the words that they use. And I'm just so excited for everyone to hear my conversation with Alonzo Bowden and Mark Gross. Pantheon of Comedy, my guests today have earned their spot as two of the greatest comedian and joke writers the world has ever known. In addition to that, they're also two incredibly compassionate, caring, intelligent people that I am proud to call my friends. First, he was the winner of season three of Last Comic Standing, has numerous comedy specials and TV appearances. I wouldn't have time to mention them all. He's currently the host of his own radio show, Who's Paying Attention, that can be heard every weekday on KBLA 1580 in Los Angeles. But don't worry, wherever you are on the planet, you can listen live on KBLA1580.com. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Alonzo Bowden. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. And uh, yeah, to start of that intro, I was wondering, who's he talking about? So, uh, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. And if that wasn't enough, we have another 30 plus year comedy veteran who has literally done everything in the comedy world a stand up comedian, a producer, a writer on some of the biggest sitcoms like Gary Unmarried, Man with a Plan, and Mike and Molly. He's also created a number of sitcoms. And this fall, you can watch his latest project, Smallwood, starring the hilarious Pete Holmes on CBS. Please welcome to the humor scientist, Mark Gross. Thank you, Matt. And uh, likewise, I was kind of going, uh, well, I can't wait to hear who your next guest is. Yeah, right. I heard the credits and I go, hey, a minute. Hey, I was listen. on those shows. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and if I did, I, it is I'm, nothing I'm going to say in this episode, I mean more than what I just said there. So, but I want to start with Alonzo and, and a story when I was thinking about this episode just resonated with me so much. It was when you first did The Tonight Show and it, the story changed the way I think about the content I create and the words we use because it, Jay came in and gave you this kind of pep talk. And a big part of these insight segments is I want to give the audience of our public health professionals a new perspective and, and real tangible tools and shift the mindset on how they, they even view the words they use. So to that point, that story with Jay about how comedians act is alive and how it can protect you. And it really, you know, changed it for me. So I don't know if Gross has ever heard the story, but if you can share with the, that, you know, if you remember it even, uh, yeah, the way you told it to me resonates so much. Get absolutely. And it, it was funny because um, Jay wasn't talking to me as much as he was talking to my girlfriend who was there with me. And he was telling her, he said, look, the act is a comedian's whole life. He said, the act feeds you, the act pays for your house, the act introduces you to the world, the act is 
it's part of you. I mean, the act is the most important thing. So it becomes, I don't know if sacred is too strong a word, but, but it's always there. This, this is the thing about being a comic and it, it may or may not be true uh, working as a writer. Mar Mark will speak to that. But you're never not working as a comic. You're never not, your brain is never not working. You're always hearing something, seeing something. There's a joke there somewhat. I, I give you an example. Yesterday, I went to Target and there's a Rolls Royce Cullinan, the, the Rolls Royce SUV in the handicapped parking spot with a Target uh, shopping cart next to it. And all I'm thinking is, what is he buying? <laughs> what is he who you, you, cause you didn't just drive a Rolls Royce you parked it in a handicapped spot which either means you are handicapped or you're a complete asshole one or the other I don't know but but why are you at Target what you know so as a comic you have to start thinking you know just that what are you buying and the punchlines come and so there's always a joke there's always something funny so yeah. awareness is part of it uh, no, absolutely. And it's almost like the first thing that comes to my mind is once you open up the subconscious is, well, maybe his servants or he stole the car or borrowing the car because it doesn't, <laughs> you know, but if you, you know, I talked about this in the last episode, I talked a little bit on the humor lab, but, but, but joke writing isn't the act of writing jokes. It's what we do, which is seeing the funny hiding in plain sight and then making the right choices of words to articulate what's going on inside our head but yeah and that is 100 percent right uh that we, we are always working and i know mark you probably can't turn it off either no it's the same thing it's it's, it's a pretty much what alonzo said it's i just drove my daughter back from a lacrosse tournament this weekend and i'm driving in a car and uh and you learn this when you start you go oh i'll remember that tomorrow you ever do that you're in your hotel room after the show and you're trying to oh. trying to just take you trying to just fine-tune that punchline. And there were nights when I'd go to bed and I'd be like, oh, I'll remember it in the morning. And you, you never do. And you always, you got to write it down. And so I, I literally, I, I, now we have voice memo. You know, when we started, we didn't have any of that. You know, it was just like we had a, our pad and our pen. And, you had, and I, would, I would literally keep my pad by my hotel bed because your mind is constantly working. And when you find that solution, man, you got you to gotta jump on it and you got you to gotta log it because you, you will not remember it. You just won't. You'll wake up in the morning, you'll be mad at yourself. So yeah, so I had to pull over and do a, a little voice memo today because I was going I knew I was going to forget the story area, but it's the same thing. It's a 24 hour a day job and it never shuts off and it's a curse and it's a blessing and it's an honor and it's a privilege um, but uh, it, it never ends. It just never ends. It's 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 round the clock. You, you, there's no rest, you know. Yeah. It's it's a strange thing. But again, and, an yeah. honor to be able to do that. And and the joke writing process again is just the idea of writing jokes. I really break it out into four processes, which is first the mining for the material, which is why you have the notebook there. As soon as you see the idea, you write it down, and you're not even worried about turning it into a joke right then. You're just worried about getting that idea on paper so you don't lose it. And then Hemingway said, write drunk, edit sober. And in his case, I do believe he absolutely meant drink and then write. And But for most of us, I think it's get outside your head, come up with the ideas, go out and see the world and just, you know, build these premises and then take it through the process of brainstorming it, punching it up. And then this is kind of what I want to talk about when you're writing for TV is that ending process where you're trying to punch it up, but also vet it one more time to make sure that there's nothing in the words here that are, because at the end of right. the day, you're writing words that you're not saying, which is different than being a comedian. Because on stage, we say the wrong thing. Yeah. We can sense the audience took it the wrong way. We could dig ourselves out of that hole. But when you're writing for TV, right. it's first of all, for another person to say, it, it may, you know, so you really have to dial it in. But, you know, do you find those different? And, and what's your process on that? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, it, you know, it's funny. It, it, uh, you know, my thing is always point of view. And you know, as comics, you know, all three of us, we all work. Together. Like you're, 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 you're writing your own POV. So you know, kind of what in Jay's discussion with Alonzo, you are introducing yourself to the world. So when you're structuring, whenever I was structuring a late night set, for example, the first sentence, especially if it's your first appearance on a big show, it should be in as fewest words possible. Tell people who you are, why they are rooting for you, and why you are funny and why they care about you, you know, and, and, and what, and how are you interesting? And it's the same way when you're writing for characters, except you're writing, it's almost like you're writing an act for, you know, several different people, several different characters. And, and if the character is organic, 
you know, and, and, you're, and, and the, it, truth is everything. Just like truth is everything in comedy, truth has to be everything in your characters and you have to, you have to, to uh, you know, stay, you have to stay true to, to who they are and, and with their backstory. And, and to me, the real people in, in, in my head that exist and, and they have lives that they've lived that I've, I pictured and imagined, but uh, you know, their point of view, you know, the jokes, whatever, whatever you were writing for them should come from their point of view. That way they're not telling jokes. They're not literally going, yeah, a guy came into a da 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 it's like you're you're literally saying here is my opinion on this matter you know if we're, whatever we're whatever we like discussion we're having now we're all giving our opinions from our own points of view and it's it's the same thing with writing and then it, it doesn't seem like a joke it's just a character telling the truth and and ideally that's what makes it funny i think this is a, you know one thing i want to talk about alonzo because with the new radio show and, and alonzo knows i you know did radio for years and as a comic we've all done radio a bunches of times um and, and you, we also saw like kind of the, you know, imagine cancel culture 15 years ago on morning radio. None of those guys would have a job. Um, so, but the idea of having to vet the words, because I do think radio is like stand up in the sense that your audience is live. It's in front of you where Mark has the ability to really vet the material, you know, with the room and, 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 and before it actually goes to air. But Alonzo's, you know, work, walking a tightrope of words without a net. Um, you know, and, and not only in a, in a comedy club, you may get booed, the FCC is just waiting to find you. So, you know, what's the process, you know, when you're doing radio and especially well, a show like yours where you're supposed to be insightful and controversial and edgy, you know, but but yet you still have to operate under the constraints of, of the government. Right. You you know what it is? You you have to think ahead of your of your words. It's almost like you're you're editing between your brain and your mouth, which is something you don't do on a stand-up stage, right? But on a radio, on radio or any broadcast, whatever, you have to have that moment of editing that knows, I can say this, I can't say that. Um, and like to, to your point of time, because I have a whole bit about this in my act about the most important word in English language is context, right? We've lost the idea of context so I can say things and just to your point I can say things on a comedy stage in front of adults that I'm not gonna say on afternoon drive AM radio it's just a different different thing and the context changes with the word it also changes with the time you know like you were saying Matt we we all did jokes 15 years ago that to do them today is only an example of what we can't say today. But but we don't right. think the same way. We don't use the same language. That changes, you know. So when it comes to a a situation like talking to your your audience if they're writing for a certain situation or getting ready for a situation, you need to know what the audience is and I will I will take it this step farther. If you don't know, ask them. Say, "Hey, is this show rated R? Is this show rated PG?" Is this show Disney clean? Like, you need to know that because some comics think I'm a badass for crossing the line. But if you cross the line in the wrong situation, you've ruined the event for everyone. Yes. Right. And potentially your own career, you know? And, yes. Yeah. And that's not our goal. Our goal is not, <laughs> you know, to, 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 to do that. It's Our goal is the opposite of that. So... Um, yeah, I, I hear you. I, you know, and in terms of, uh, you know, writing for, for me, there, there are two things. First of all, we have S and P, we have standards and practices who, you know, will come in and say, yeah, you can do this. You can't do that. They go through the script and they give notes constantly. So we, we have a huge advantage knowing of, you know, what we get away with, but you know, in your mind, you should know what's right and what isn't right, you know, ahead of time. You know I mean? You should, you should know what's, what's proper, what isn't, but still you have, we have advertisers to answer to and things like that. When I hear that, well, you can't make jokes for anything anymore. I'm like, really? Well, take a look through history and look at all the stuff that was really funny that still holds up, that is absolutely, uh, you know, still gold and still really funny and still still uh, makes me laugh. Watch some, you know, uh, black and white movies that don't even have words that you understand the funny in that because it's about want and it's about emotion and it's about feelings. Those are the things that, that intrigue me and interest me and that I, that I like to, to steer into for comedy. No, yeah, it's very lazy. It's very lazy to say, well, we can't write jokes anymore. We can't do comedy anymore. It's like, yes, you can. You just right. have to work harder. 
You may have to work different, but you can absolutely still do it. Yeah, you have to do comedy in 2021 under the parameters that society is accepted. You know, I mean, you could either be part of the solution. Remember, we pushed free speech. Comedians did that. Lenny Bruce, you know, George Carlin, mm -hmm. they pushed it. And now we're trying to walk it back. We're not taking away your freedoms. But I say, if if one person is marginalized, we're all marginalized. If nobody woke up that morning wanting to be the punchline of a joke. I mean, it, 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 maybe it took us all. We were talking about all of us getting older before, uh, before we started recording. But it, maybe it took us all these years. But we are now aware of each other, and yet we have to have some empathy with that. And that's really what I think joke writing has to involve now, is really thinking about the audience. Not in the way that we used to say, in being, becoming a hack, making the material so watered down that, you know, it's not funny at all. But it's just understanding that, you know, everyone deserves a chance to, to, to be happy and nobody went to a comedy club to feel worse about themselves or watch the sitcom to feel worse about themselves or listen to a radio show. So, you know, I try to avoid, you know, what I call bleed throughs and these syntax landmines that, that, that have so much emotional baggage, you know, it, it changes so quickly. Things we could have done 10 years ago, you know, overnight, something could happen and now you can't do that. It used to be if a plane crashed, you couldn't do airline jokes for a while till it, 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 it you know, time went on, but now it really is that we're not just going to do it anymore. We're just going to do it in a, in a different way. And, but knowing the bigger thing that's at play here, which is inclusion. I mean, you know, the, the comedy shouldn't be about punching down all the time, you know, and, and if that's your act though, yeah. and we all know sometimes comedians, that's their act. And that's not who they are. You know, um, Lisa Lampinelli, Don, Don Rickles was the nicest man in real life. I met him when he was old and I know both of you probably have too. Nothing like his act, you know, yeah. but that was the act. You know? But that's why, but see, right. that, that, I'm glad you brought that up. The reason it worked for Rickles is because you could feel the love behind it as opposed that's to, right as like if a comic was really really racist like we'll use the the michael richards example dropping the n-bomb at the laugh factory there was nothing funny in that moment like there were you know what i mean and the audience knew right away the audience was like whoa that's whereas you know i saw don rickles make fun of a guy from tonga and I'm like, who has Tonga material? Like, I don't know how to insult someone from Tonga. That that it was it was beautiful. And but Rickles, I I got insulted backstage by Rickles. It was one of the highlights of my career to get insulted by Don Rickles because nothing but love from that guy. He was he was friendly. He loved everybody. And his point was, we're all funny. Cause we're all yeah. we all have something wrong with you. You're black. You're white. You're Jewish. You're from Tonga. Whatever. <laughs> There's something funny about all of us, and he pointed to it, and we laughed at it. It was rooted in love. You know, that's what it yeah. was. It was. It was. It, he was a man who whose act and whose being was rooted in love, and the audience picked up on that, and that's very important. And you can't fake that. The audiences can smell a rat. They immediately smell a rat. If you're faking something, ah, you know, you, we've all seen that comic that. Has this premise, this setup that's like yeah, that didn't happen. You're just setting that up to get to this punchline. Come on, um, but but you know, he was he clearly was was a, a person who was was uh, rooted in goodness and love. And I before I forget to, to the earlier point, um, it's an honor and a privilege to do what we do. It is a huge privilege, and and every second that we have to do it should not be wasted. And when you are challenged to go, okay. Um, these are the parameters I have to write within or work within. That's how you grow. You plateau when you take, when you, when you stop and you're punching down and you're, you know, you, you stop, you don't grow anymore. But what the more parameters we are given, we should look at that as a challenge to dig deeper into character and soul. Um, you know, the way that the musicians do, you know, I mean, if, if it's superficial, you're only going to go so far, but when you're given more parameters to me, I look at that as a challenge that I embrace wholly and say, okay, let's dig in deeper. What is the fun? And that thing, I guarantee you, anytime you dig in deeper and you look a little deeper and you dig more and more. I worked for Chuck Lorre. I sat next to him at a table for six years. He's one of the most successful TV, you know, uh, comedy creators in, in, in of our generation. And he would always scream at us, dig deeper, dig deeper. And I was, I was, I was going, come on, man, we're, this is good stuff, you know, but damn it, he was right every time. We'd stop, we'd dig, and we would find something 
that 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 wasn't cheap that wasn't the, the quick easy thing and it's always more rewarding and satisfying and when you drive home that night and you're thinking about the scene you just filmed and the character and what that character said to the person or whatever joke you wrote uh, to, to to ease the tension in the situation whatever it was it always is more it's it's more satisfying and rewarding and it's something that 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 makes you grow it makes you a better writer it makes you a better performer um, you know, so I, I don't look at it as a negative. I look at it as something that's going to make, make me, you know, produce, give a better product to people that will stand the test of time and also, you know, grow as a writer is, you know, the, the, I think is the right way to look at it personally. The thing I would say, if I'm giving advice to new people, keep it simple. Don't try to prove how smart you are yes. by using big words, unless that's part of your act, unless using using the word you know like you look at somebody like anthony jeselnik who is just a wordsmith like like with him you you may have to look up a word or two <laughs> to realize how funny that is what he just said but that's that's a very specific comic with a very very specific style i would say don't try to prove how smart you are yeah mark any last little tidbits for uh for our, our folks yeah, well yeah. Alonzo actually inspired me to say something that that uh, I always tell people: make yourself vulnerable. You know how you make yourself vulnerable. What are your fears? You know that's the stuff that gets people's attention. You know, um, to entertain us ultimately surprise, right? You, if you've heard a joke before, why aren't you laughing at it? If you've heard it before, because because it's not a surprise anymore. You've already heard the joke. I mean, you know most jokes. So my thing is vulnerability, man. Make yourself vulnerable. Admit your fears. D go dig into your you know, expose yourself. That's when you care. When people care, they are laughing and they are entertained and, and, and it's surprising. It is surprising. And so I would say vulnerability and, and, uh, and, and truth, truth and vulnerability is what, is what makes people laugh. And, and, uh, and I, I stand by that and I always will. So that's make would be my a powerful connection for sure and and we've seen it at the club level you guys have seen it from the the, the media tv radio level all great advice and just want to thank you once again and please make sure to check out alonzo's new radio show who's paying attention weekdays from 4 to 7 p.m pacific at kbla1580.com and this fall i'm so excited like everyone else to watch mark's new sitcom smallwood starring pete holmes on cbs Thanks again, guys, and uh, be well. Thank you. It's Thanks, been an man. honor. Thank you, sir. Welcome inside the Humor Lab, where today we're going to case study two of my favorite jokes. And I'm going to show you how I took them from premise to punchline and thought about the words every step of the way, and more importantly, how you can too. But before we get into the jokes, let's take a look at what I view as the joke writing process, because I do think... Big misconception and then, you know, a lot of bad ideas when it comes to joke writing that the idea of joke writing is I have to write a joke. I see something funny. I think it's something funny and I have to write the joke. <clears throat> right. But it really is this four part process that allows you to really define what the joke is, why you think it's funny, and then take it for a ride. To me, joke writing is about defining that premise and then dragging it through your subconscious, allowing you, every memory, every thought, every emotion, what the joke makes you think of, rise to the surface, and then you're building a pile of raw materials from that that you can now construct the joke and then take it into the punch-up phase. But first, we want to mine for material, just identifying premises, thinking more conceptually why you think it's funny, but just getting them ready to take into the brainstorming process. Once you're in there, letting it just go for a ride. What does one thought make you think of when that next thought leads you to something else? And just kind of building, as I said, this pile of raw materials that you can now apply the joke writing formula. And remember, what I'm teaching here is long form stand up, not set up punchline, but set up. Describe the situation punchline, tagline, throwaway line, and I'll explain all of this later. And then once you're left at the end, of the last part of the process, we're in the punch-up phase. And if it's a joke, we're trying to make the joke funnier, find the right word, more descriptive words, more colorful words, funnier words, less offensive words. This is where you can start to walk the jokes back. Um, 
and really thinking about how the words will be received by the audience and making the best choices there. But if you wind up doing this, and I'll walk you through my process and how we case study these two jokes, uh, but just think about it this way for now. Understanding your truth is your biggest asset. You know, an ounce of truth is worth more than a pound of lie. This is what's going to be engaging. This will also help you as once you get into the brainstorming process, because if it is your truth, there's a heck of a lot more truth behind that. So you want to start off that way uh, strategically and with intention. Never discount the power of pen in hand. It stimulates the mental hard drive, opens up the creative process. Um, a heck of a lot more than a keyboard would do. So, you know, put a pen in hand, get that notebook and start writing out these things. You'd be amazed at starting off in that positive place. What amazing things can happen. And this last one is, is huge as well. Most people write jokes or write content in the paragraph form. They're basically writing the material to be read versus said. One thing I want you to think about is you're always writing dialogue for either you or for a character, um, but it is dialogue. It isn't. It isn't like a book or it isn't like you know a proposal or something like that. You really want to write it as dialogue, separating each part of it. And then what happens is the words can be isolated. You can focus on each word individually, whereas if they were in the paragraph form, they would all run together. Also, the paragraph form affects timing. You know. The words can't come to life if they're in the paragraph form. They have to be broken out, and that'll make more sense in a second. So with that, let's get to our first joke. Right now, though, now the, now the kid's in their car seat, right? Car seat, great invention, saves a lot of kids' lives, but I think that's what messed with their head a little bit, right? Because they sit in that chair like it's their little throne, don't they? Right? Just... <laughs> They give a shit that you're driving a car at 70 miles an hour. They just sit back barking out demands like they're Caesar. That I believe in a juice box. Please, some goldfish, my man. Then I'm finding Nemo. He amuses me. Five minutes later, take him away. I've grown tired. Bring me the one they call Spongebob. So the inspiration for that joke, true story, my brother and I took my nephew Lucas when he was about three years old down to Disney World in Florida. Started the trip in DC, so about 12 hours we were in the car. And Lucas was in his car seat about three years old and he would take a nap and he would just kind of wake up and as soon as he woke up, he just start demanding things. I want something to eat. How far away are we? Put on a movie. And it struck me that he was sitting in that little chair like it was his throne. So the, 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 the initial premise was kids in their car seats, and that's enough. Now, as I started to define the premise, it was kids in their car seats sitting in that chair like it was their little throne. And now as I move into the brainstorming process, the premise is defined. So all these memories of, you know, kings and 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 and. and, and movies and, and, and just ideas and thoughts and things Lucas has done before and things other kids have done before all come to the surface. And then the word tyrant came to mind. And this is where you really want to vet the words. Tyrant is a funny word. It's very descriptive and tulip. I mean, excuse me, Lucas was acting very tyranny, but it's a negative word as well. It's got negative connotations. And I want this joke to be a cute, fun, joke, you know, that everyone can enjoy and not as soon as they hear the word tyrant, they shut down and it's what I call the bleed throughs will come in, you know. So I didn't want to use tyrant. I got to walk it back. So King Tyrant, as it's going through my subconscious, the movie Gladiator comes up. And really, that was the choice. He wasn't a tyrant. He was a Caesar. Very gluttonous, just sitting there, just, I believe I need a juice box. You know, starting to use syntax that Caesar would use in writing the dialogue for me, but from the point of view of a three-year-old. You know, please, some goldfish, my men. Turn on Finding Nemo, he amuses me. And all of this is what I call act-outs. You know, it's, it's a way to enhance and elevate the material, um, really performing it out. But, you know, it has to be funny first, and the act-outs will elevate the material. But the material has got to be good on its own. Um, there's only so much the act-out can do. But 
With that in mind, let's take a look at our next joke. See what little kids get to play with now? <gasps> they got good toys now. Virtual reality, DVD, CD-ROM, computer games. And what do they always say? They're bored. They don't know what bored is. You spend all day in room with a freaking action sketch, that's bored. You spend a rainy day with a light bright, that's as bored as it gets right there, just. So I think that toy joke is a great example of how to, I use the joke writing formula. Simple setup, description of the situation, only the words that need to be there, punchline, tagline, throwaway line. And let me explain quickly what taglines and throwaway lines are. Since we're mining for the material in the way that I showed you in the joke writing process, we're gonna come up with four, five, six, some of my jokes have 14 punchlines. I'm gonna come up with a lot of punchlines that, you know, we don't want to just pick the best one, you know, in, in traditional stand-up setup punchline, you pick the best punchline, you use that one, but we want to pick the best few. And instead of using segues, become really efficient with how we connect the material. And literally the taglines and throwaway lines should lead you right into the next piece of material. And know that the anatomy of joke writing can work for your campaigns, can work whether you're writing a joke or you're just trying to write any form of communication. It's a very efficient, way to communicate but also an incredibly efficient and intentional way to create and construct the material as well so with the toy joke very simple have you seen the toys kids get to play with now they got good toys now virtual reality computer games they don't know what bored is you spend all day in your room with the net just sketch that's bored what a piece of junk this is why does somebody kill me i'd rather be in school you know, using the act outs to elevate and enhance the material, but knowing that the joke has to be solid, you know, there's only so much the act out can help, you know. Uh, so, you know, keep that in mind. And two big things to keep in mind before I leave you, in joke writing, editing is everything. Just get down to the words you need, you know, and then try to be really efficient with those words, you know. Is there one word that can do the job of 20, as we mentioned? Carlin was great at this. I mean, a master of editing. Remember, his, his material was so controversial. And whether you agree with his politics or not, we all have to agree that this was one of the greatest joke writers to ever live. And he didn't have any wasted motions because he had to get his point of view across because he was on the clock before, you know, people, if they use their own thought process, might take the dog joke in a different direction. So he had to solidify his point of view quickly. And he was one of the greatest editors of all time. Timing, you know, again, we got the greatest joke in the world and then not tell it well. Um, and the delivery and the timing could be the thing that affects us. 2,000 year old man records. I learned everything about timing. Remember, it's about coming in a fraction of a second early, fraction of a second late, can compromise the whole joke, how to hold the audience there. And you know you're about to beat them over the head with the joke. So I learned a lot about that, how to be heavy handed and gentle at the same time. So go check out the 2000 year old man, check out George Carlin. And with that, let's look at our last big takeaway. Thanks so much for joining us today, and I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did putting it together. My world is the words I use. They mean everything to me, personally, professionally, and just as a citizen of the planet. My hope is that everyone will start to be even more intentional and thoughtful about the words they use, because words matter. And whether you think it's a big deal or just people are too sensitive, as the amazing young women showed us in the Men Working story, they're sensitive for a reason, and we all need to start paying attention. But I understand we have to start somewhere. In 2020, the United Nations put out a list and a call to the world to start using gender neutral language. They said, if you don't know someone's gender or when talking about a group, use gender neutral language. Makes sense. Mankind to humankind, chairman to chair, businessman to representative, policeman to police officer, landlord to owner, boyfriend or girlfriend to partner, salesman to salesperson, manpower to workforce, maiden name to family name, fireman to firefighter, and husband or wife to spouse. Now this is a short list. 
But again, a good place to start, to be more considerate about the words we use when it comes to gender. And hopefully that will be a gateway to making us more compassionate and empathetic about the words we choose across the board, instantly making our world a happier, healthier, and more inclusive place for all of us. And it really could just be that simple. A solution would be to have a sign that includes all people. So please change. Thanks again for joining us. I hope to see you next time on The Humor Scientist. And remember, when the going gets tough, the tough get laughing. Be well, my friends.